I'm Alan Mick, not Dr. Alan Mick. Um, actually, I did receive a doctorate from our local high school because uh, when I helped with some uh, um, internships, they issued a certificate and it said Dr. Alan Mick on it. <laughs> and since they're a accredited educational institution, I figure you know I should uh, take credit for that. But not in this environment. <laughs> um, so I'm going to be talking to you about um, a unique, uh, we think it's a unique application of SpaceWire in the context of uh, system integration and testing for the Solar Probe Plus uh, spacecraft. And I'm going to be uh, describing a little bit about our mission, a little bit about our architecture, and then how we've um, uh, utilized the space wire to help us out a little bit during the integration and testing uh, phase. So um, before I get into that, I would like to uh, give a call out to our sponsors. Um, we have uh, with us uh, Star Dundee, who uh, are um, um, principals in the uh, in the space in the field of space wire, and uh, I'm upstairs uh, doing some multitasking. I'm running upstairs, and I'm using Star Dundee equipment, um, even as we speak, in order to test some of the things that we're going to talk about here, and. Um, our um, um, SpaceWire drivers and our SpaceWire software comes from our supplier, um, <coughs> um, Aeroflex Geisler, who aren't here today. But uh, the Aeroflex Geisler folks uh, use Artems as their standard base uh, operating system. So we're utilizing Artems, and Artems is another one of our sponsors here. So if you get a chance, please be sure to go by the uh, desks outside and talk to those folks. Now, uh, so this, the Solar Probe Plus uses the space wire as the primary data interconnect between the single board computers and the avionics and the radios. And I'm going to show you a little diagram of that in a little bit. And uh, specifically, the space wire router has capabilities that can greatly, that we found, greatly simplify spacecraft test configurations uh, simplify simulation of missing spacecraft components and allow injection of data for testing fault conditions. Now the capabilities that we're utilizing and is, uh, are the logical addressing capabilities of SpaceWire. Uh, and that's a standard feature of SpaceWire. We're also using a, a feature called packet duplication, which is a a special feature of our SpaceWire router, the Geisler, uh, excuse me, the uh, Goddard SpaceWire router, and um, it, of a uh, remote updating of the uh, routing table in the router for these. Um, and I'm going to explain all of this as we go along. But first, I'm going to tell you a little bit about our mission, Solar Probe Plus. Um, Everybody here does things that are completely mind-boggling and awesome, and this is no exception. It's mind-boggling boggling and awesome. We are going to fly a spacecraft uh, around the sun 24 times. We're going to get closer and closer and closer to the sun as we go along so that we will be flying through the sun's corona, and we are going to be uh, determining some of these uh, uh, scientific objectives here, tracing the energy and the heat, determining what accelerates the uh, solar corona and the solar wind, and uh, exploring the mechanisms that accelerate and transport, transport the uh, particles. That's as close to being a doctor as I get right there. So, um, so, so the way this is described in the press is that we are going to send a mission and plunge into the sun. <laughs> we're not, <laughs> I've seen that in, in, in several, we're not quite going to plunge into the sun, but we are going to get really, really close. We're going to be actually flying through the sun's corona. 
Now, uh, this is spacecraft overview. Three axis stabilized. We have wheels and uh, thrusters for momentum dumping. We have this um, really important thing up at the front that shields us from the sun. It's the thermal protection <coughs> system. We're actively cooled uh, with uh, water and a mechanical pump and uh, radiators underneath the uh, protection system. And the design drivers are the solar environment, of course, mass and power. And mass and power are kind of <laughs> important. Even though we're really, really, really close to the sun, we don't have very much power. <laughs> and that's because we can't flip those wings out, the solar array uh, out without them you know, burning to a crisp. So we're confined. When we're at the sun, we're actually very much more confined than uh, one might think. So now this is the internal architecture of the, of the, of the uh, avionics, which shows the use of the um, space wire network. So what we have here are, over here we have the three single board computers. Um, you can think of them as one. And they're, ro they're connected <coughs> into these, these tiny slivers right here. This is the avionic side A, and this is the avionic side B. The right in here is a space wire router, which really should be more emphasized on this diagram, but it isn't. This is a spacecraft interface card, a spacecraft interface card. And then connected through the routers is the transponders, <coughs> and, um, and, the, and we have an imager. And, um, what I want you to note here, however, is that one of these connections through the router is this uh, spacecraft test port. That allows us to hook uh, an external system right into the space wire network here and uh, receive signals through the, through the routers just as if it were um, uh, par part and parcel of the uh, network. So that's that's the key to what we're going to be talking about here. So, uh, the t so I'm going to be focusing on our test bed because that's what we're really, what what we're really is the subject of this is the w is the way our test bed operates with the spacecraft to allow us to do integration uh, and system testing. So the test bed has several capabilities. Um, it substitutes for components that, that are under development or have been swapped out for various reasons. So, for instance, if we have, uh, um, we have a couple of transponders, we have an imager, we could have a um, uh, transponder um, uh, or radio um, um, engineering model plugged in. And then we could plug that out and plug a uh, more you know, flight unit in. Or if we needed to do some uh, testing early on, we could use uh, software emulation. So the test bed allows us to uh, put those, plug those uh, components in when they are not available or when, they, when we're using um, um, emulations for them. The test bed maintains a truth model that simulates the dynamics of the spacecraft based on the history of the reaction wheel and the thruster activations and other such data. The test bed updates the avionics telemetry with the truth maintained by the truth model so that uh, we can uh, tell the spacecraft that we're flying around in space, we're in such and such an orientation, uh, et cetera, et cetera, and see how it actually reacts to to those, sim those simulated environmental conditions. And uh, the test bed allows injection of non-nominal data to simulate fault conditions so that we can test the autonomy responses. So that's what our test bed has to do. Now, uh, this is a, a tried and true implementation of how you would uh, connect the spacecraft systems into the uh, truth to into the test bed and into the truth model, you'd have the flight software CPU and the avionics, and then you would have, uh, for instance, UART links over to the test bed, which could be doing uh, the things that we mentioned um, to um, um, 
substitute for components or to inject errors or to inject truth. Now, I'm going to, this is a little bit of a, a sidestep from what, what, from the, from the, but what I'm going to do is I want to take a look inside this avionics side A portion here because this will help with my uh, explanation further on. So, so inside the avionics side, uh, avionics, we have the space wire router, which has a space wire, which is, controls the space wire network. And what we're showing here is one, um, one of these uh, spacecraft interface cards that we have. So the flight software on the CPU can interact with the space wire router, and it sends, over the space wire router, it sends uh, information into uh, buffers that are in um, the RAM on the SCIF card, and then this, uh, the spacecraft interface card. And then the spacecraft interface card can um, uh, transmit those over the UART connections to the actual components. So the actual components are out here on the UART, and they can send in, in instruments and read out uh, commands and telemetry. And the space wire uh, sends into these buffers the uh, information that's going to come out. So, um, so basically, the spacecraft interface card, which is what we call this, uh, acts as sort of a uh, bridge between a space wire protocol and the various UART protocols. I call it UART. There's uh, a lot of different, you know, each manufacturer has a different interface. We have to uh, accommodate uh, legacy items. So that offers a bridging capability between whatever is on the components and the space wire, which kind of then takes over and distributes that to the, the flight software. You notice that the test bed is a, a node on the space wire, so it's plugged right into this router through that test bed interface. The, um, the thing that I want to explain uh, on this diagram that's getting maybe a little bit ahead, but I, I want to um, make, make this clear because it's important later on, is that the flight software uses what we call logical addressing. So each, each component, normally, each node on the space wire network has a logical address, and we use that address to tell the router where we want this thing to go. Now, uh, as it happens, a particular node can have multiple logical addresses. So there's uh, one port that goes out to this spacecraft interface card, and normally you would use one logical address for that uh, node. However, the capability exists to send multiple um, logical addresses to a single node. So what we're doing is, I'm getting a little ahead here, but I, this is my opportunity to explain this, I'm sorry. So what, we, what we're doing here is this component up here has one logical address, this component here has another logical address, and this component down here has another logical address. And so as those signals are going through, as the protocol goes through the space wire router, it appears that it's going to multiple different discrete nodes to an observer when really it's going to particular buffers on one node. And um, the, the importance of that will will uh, become, a, well, I'll explain the importance of that a little bit later. So this is the way that you would normally handle this sort of situation where you want to be able to plug um, into, plug various components from the spacecraft into the test bed or swap them in and out. You would have these, these loopback plugs. So here's the, um, here's the avionics that we were talking about. Here's the UARTs going out, and instead of going directly to some component or flight uh, unit, what they do is they take a U-turn through this loop, loop back plug, and then go on out. So this is a flight configuration where the, uh, the <laughs> plugs are, you know, just send the signals right on through. However, if you want to introduce the test bed into this, you take those plugs and you substitute um, uh, testbed cabling for that. 
and, the K, and then the test bed over here can uh, interject signals, receive signals, interject signals, feedback um, uh, information, and you can use that to run your tests. So uh, this, this physical unit here, I was going to say this stuff or this clap trap, <laughs> this physical unit here, um, uh, that adds complexity, mass, um, to, the, to the configuration. And you have to be able to cable this and uncable it and make sure that it's correct. So what we've conceived of doing is we've conceived of, uh, in many cases, instead of utilizing this uh, configuration, this technique, what we've done is we've plugged the test bed right into the space wire router, and we don't have the loopback plugs and the other um, uh, items that allow us to tap in there. Instead, we're going to tap in through the space wire router. And um, so this is the test bed over here, and the test bed can do all of the things that it previously did with the, with the loopbacks and the physical connections, but it's doing that through the space wire router. So uh, these are the capabilities that are used, and I hope this is not too wordy or too... Uh, so what we're using is we're using the remote memory access protocol, and that allows us to send um, uh, requests to read and write memory to a specific logical address on the Spacewire bus. So what we're doing is... Go back here, sorry. So we, we send an RMAP request into the router to write to logical address A up here, and that writes a command into this buffer. Or we send an RMAP remote memory access protocol uh, message into the, through the router to logical address A to read from this buffer and that allows us to read the telemetry that was deposited there. So our map is what allows us to do that. So all, only the, flights, only the fly, flight software initiates the our map transactions during um, uh, flight. However, during system level testing, we're going to allow the test bed to initiate some our map transactions in order to snoop into what's going on in those avionics buffers and uh, on the space wire bus. So we use the logical addressing. As I mentioned, each, each separate component, regardless of its physical node, has its own separate logical address. And this is important because the testbed software can reroute transactions for specific components by updating just that logical address in the router. And since then, then we're only intervening in that one specific component. And that's why we needed logical addresses for all of the various components that we're controlling, even though they're all going to the same space wire node, we use discrete logical addresses for that. Packet duplication. This is not a standard uh, space wire feature. It's a feature of our, our specific uh, router implementation. And what this allows us to do is it allows us to specify in the logical address table two destinations for a single logical address. And when a, when a data stream comes in, when a packet comes in for uh, that logical address, if there's a duplicate that has been established, the router streams that uh, packet out to both of those end nodes instead of just one. It duplicates the information and routes it off. And it's, uh, and it's basically simultaneous with the information that's coming in, so it doesn't really, it's, uh, doesn't really add much overhead or much um, 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 interference with, with what's going on in the router normally. So what happens is that the, the uh, packet comes in, it streams out uh, to two destinations, and the test bed will be one of those two destinations. So the test bed can snoop on what's going on on the space wire network by duplicating packets. 
And it can do that by updating the router table because it's capable of independently updating the router table through the space wire, just as uh, uh, any node could update that table. And, uh, and since we've d made the uh, logical addresses very discrete, it can pick and choose which, which pieces of information it really wants to see. So it doesn't have to be see everything, it just needs to see the things that are important at that particular time. So uh, the, the capabilities that we mentioned were substitution and uh, so a few other of these capabilities. So component substitution, we utilize the logical addressing. So the test bed substitutes, to test for the test bed to substitute for a component that's under development or have been swapped out for various reasons, the test bed updates the router table so that it is the destination for that component. And then we have a software emulation in the test bed that allows it to, uh, to perform the function that the um, component was supposed to uh, perform. So for instance, right now we are still developing the radios. Um, we have the flight, flight, the test bed software has updated the router table uh, through a script so that it substitutes for the radio. And we can test our flight software as if the radio was there, but it's really going to the test bed. Uh, truth model maintenance. This utilizes packet duplication. So the test bed software maintains a truth model that simulates the dynamics of the spacecraft and, um, and needs to understand the reaction wheel and thruster actuations and the other actuations that take place um, uh, from the guidance and control system. So the test bed updates the logical addresses of the components, uh, providing the sensor data and the space wire route in the space wire routing table. The update specifies the test bed as a secondary destination for the packets. So anything going to or from that destination gets duplicated to the test bed. The router duplicates the packages and then the test bed can kind of snoop on what's going on, maintain its um, uh, truth model uh, in a um, more or less a benign um, manner without really uh, directly intervening in what's going on. It gets to see what's going on without actually, you know, physically plugging into the um, uh, components. So uh, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go through a couple of the scenarios and show you how this works. So uh, command snooping, for instance, we want to be able to uh, uh, keep track of the reaction wheel commands as they're issued. So right at this point in the space wire uh, router, we set up a logical we set up a logical address for the specific commands for the thrusters. We have the um, capability of updating the router table so that the thrusters commands are duplicated. So as the flight software, as the guidance and control sends in the command to the space wire router to activate a thruster. Uh, that command gets duplicated. It goes to the test bed as well as to the avionics and then the response comes back from the avionics just as normal but the test bed is, uh, understands what's been going on because it's, it's got this duplicated packet. So that's command snooping. Now the other side of command snooping is snooping the telemetry which is a response not, not going out. So in this case uh, the flight software issues what we call an RMAP read. It issues this command through the space wire router over to the avionics. And, um, and in, the, in, the, in the, um, the read, it says send that back to logical address uh, XYZ. So X, or in this case H. I guess I have H here, so I'll use H as the example. So we say, OK, we send this to component G, and we say send it back to H. Well, H is the logical address of the, one of the logical addresses of the flight software CPU. So the packet comes back to the router. The router says, oh, this goes to H, and it comes back to 
um, the flight software. At the same time, the test bed has updated the router table so that logical address H is being duplicated. And so the router not only sends it to the flight software, it also sends the uh, telemetry over to the test bed through the packet duplication capability. So the test bed can snoop on the commands and the test bed can snoop on the telemetry coming back. It can see at individual component levels everything that the flight software sees uh, at its discretion. So truth fault injection. This is a little bit more complicated. So the test bed updates its avionics telemetry uh, and it, it tracks the commands, it tracks the telemetry, it maintains the truth uh, in the truth model uh, and um, the test bed allows the injection of non-nominal data to simulate fault conditions for testing autonomy responses. So what happens is that the test bed uh, through the space wire router performs a read modify write sequence that substitutes either the truth or the fault into the um, um, telemetry buffer that's in the SCIF card before the flight software reads it. So we send an RMAP read from the avionics telemetry buffer for the component. We read from that. The software uses the truth model to decide what the flight software really should see, or it uses a command to inject a fault to uh, decide what the um, flight software should see. It modifies the telemetry, and then it writes it back to the avionics telemetry component for the buffer. And then the flight software, innocently and unaware, reads that telemetry buffer and finds whatever it was that the test bed stuck in there for it. So I have a little diagram that kind of demonstrates this. Um, so this is the read. So the test bed can send a, an RMAP command out to the space wire router. It goes back to the avionics component that it was intended for and comes back to the test bed. So that's the read portion. In here, the, the, the testbed software would then uh, update that message and decide what, to, what, what kind of uh, manipulation has to be done on it or what it wants to tell the flight software is happening out there in the, quote, real world, unquote. And then it writes, uses an RMAP write transaction to write that into the, through the router back into the avionics buffer, and uh, it gets a response back. So now uh, what's sitting in the uh, avionics buffer is whatever it was that the test bed put in there. And the flight software comes along, accesses that, and uses the information as if it came from the actual component, uh, if that component exists or is em being emulated. Now one thing that I should mention here is that um, uh, you could imagine this being so somewhat willy-nilly, you know, but, but what, what we do is on the, um, on the spacecraft, we have a schedule, very tightly controlled schedule, which we use for accessing the components on the um, avionics. So we have a 50 hertz uh, time division multiplex type uh, schedule with discrete transactions for each component. So the test bed uh, does not just come in there and do that at any time and the flight software doesn't come in there and read this stuff at any time. What happens is that the test bed has a priori knowledge of exactly when these um, uh, uh, transactions occur through the flight software. So it comes in just before, just after the telemetry is written and just before the flight software accesses it, we leave a little bit of room in the schedule for the test bed to perform this operation. So in conclusion, by utilizing the logical addressing and the packet duplication uh, and coordinating it all through the test bed, we allow greater fidelity to flight configuration during testing, improving our test-as-you-fly philosophy. 
That is, we don't have um, uh, the connector cables and things of that sort that we have to swap in and swap out. The loopback connectors are not required at the UART interfaces and may be eliminated, which eliminates a mass pen penalty. It simplifies the, the design and, and fabrication, and it simplifies this configuration changes during integration and test. Rather than physically swapping these things out, we inject um, logical address information into the space wire router. And the hardware may be simulated in the test bed at the space wire level, allowing temporary removals. And that's my, um, that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> any questions or any, uh, any uh, questions? Concern? Yes. Yes. Go ahead. Um, oh, wait. Oh, I'm sorry. I shouldn't be trying to coordinate that. No. no. <laughs> uh, single schedule. That's right. Single schedule. <laughs> highly predictable. So this is really awesome. Um, I just, so I'm glad that you clarified your discussion about the, 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 the fitting into the 50 year schedule. I was curious why you didn't choose um, to route from the avionics to the test bed and have the test bed then provide the data to the buffer on the skiff um, when you're in sort of this fault injection mode, why you have this sort of external read modify write as opposed to interposing on everything. Um, um, I'm, I'm, I'm actually not as uh, sophisticated at, of the, with, the flight with the fault injection scenarios as uh, some of our uh, engineers who have actually designed all this stuff. <laughs> but, um, but basically, we, we, we started with the concept um, pretty far into our design, and we made it fit into uh, what existed as a sort of an opportunistic uh, uh, thing. So that might have something to do, have some effect on how we uh, designed it. And uh, if you're curious about the, the uh, bus scheduling aspect of this, the, uh, the 50 hertz scheduling and how that works, uh, there's a paper that is on the, um, uh, the uh, Spacewire conference that's held by uh, ESA every year. A uh, few years ago, if you search for Spacewire and Solar Probe and, um, and my name, leave out the doctor, uh, you'll, you'll find that uh, paper and that will explain that in a little bit more detail. In fact, you'll actually see some of these illustrations in that paper. <laughs> okay. For the um, test pad itself, can you talk about how reliable that is in terms of hitting the, the, the frame that it needs to hit? Because if, you, you know, if you're interposing in a pretty tight window, you know, how reliably do you hit that? Well, uh, the, f the first of all, we have um, a lot of margin in our, spa in our schedule. So but let me explain. Uh, the way that we uh, coordinate all of this over the Spacewire uh, network is that we use another uh, Spacewire capability called time codes. So the time reference on the, on the, uh, in the avionics, uh, which controls the router, generates the time codes. So everything is synchronized through the time codes at a 20 millisecond, 50 hertz level. So we've designed the, um, the space wire transactions, we hope to occupy about 10 milliseconds out of that 20 milliseconds in each of the, each of the frames. And, um, and therefore, the uh, test bed can synchronize using the time codes and understands when the quiet period is for its uh, transactions. Then uh, the, the overall schedule, uh, for instance, write to this component, read the telemetry from this component, that's, that's very rigorously separated by these, these slots, by the time code slots. And uh, so we, we can allow um, uh, an entire slot between the write and the read, or we can two if we necessary. So the other thing, the other aspect of this is 
that um, the router itself, uh, when we first started this, we were very concerned about just this question and we were very careful to allow a lot of margin and make sure that we could do things uh, very discreetly so that only there was only one. What, it turns out that the, the SpaceWire, the RMAP protocol and the SpaceWire uh, router and uh, the whole transaction sequence is actually very robust. So, so if there is some now uh, we don't want to. We don't want to over over. We want one operation on one component to be very discreet from the other operation. But in between, if there's a little bit of a collision with something that the spacecraft is doing and something that the test bed is doing, it's no big deal. We um, we are using the uh, test bed almost as a uh, a way of. Um, 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 peeking and poking into the memory on the various components. So we, we actually are quite comfortable with issuing these transactions independently and asynchronously over the test bed and getting results back uh, just to see what's going on. And we're very confident in, you know, that we're not going to screw everything up when we do that because it all actually pretty much works. <laughs> Other questions? Yes. You showed a, a test bed diagram, I think, where you have the uh, a CPU and the, the space wire, and you're going to an interface box into the sim. Have, yeah. you, have you guys started, um, started transitioning to test platform models where, you're, where it's completely software-based, where you're hosting a, an emulator for your processor, running your flight code, and then having to model these things. Because I'm wondering how difficult it is to reliably model uh, space wire, space fiber, and its router in that type of environment. So um, we're modeling components. For instance, the radio, or the power supply unit, et cetera, et cetera. But we have not been actually modeling, if I understand your question, I'm not sure. We have not been modeling the mechanics of the space wire network itself in a very, um, uh, very um, fidelious way. Early on, I, we used a, um, a discrete event model just to start experimenting with the timing and seeing how things would work. But I don't think that's what you're referring to. So we, do, we, don't, we don't simulate the space wire at all. We actually use the space wire. And we simulate the end nodes, the components, the radio, the electronic control unit, the PSC. It's fairly standard. It's just I think people are moving to full software simulation and stuff. Yeah. And um, we have not done that with the, with the space wire network itself. But that sounds like something that and you're right, that the level of emulation that we're doing is, is pretty standard. What we're adding <coughs> here is just the fact that we're doing some of this over the SpaceWire network rather than using plugs into the UARTs. OK. Thank you very much. Anything else? All right. OK. Thank you.